TSR-2, Britain's new tactical strike and reconnaissance aircraft, makes its maiden flight at Boscombe Down in Wiltshire. With a Canberra and a Lightning escorting it, the 15-minute flight brought an end to three months of postponements, if not an end to the controversy. The cancellation of the TSR-2 in 1965 left the RAF in a difficult position. The service had a need for both an intermediate to long-range bomber and a tactical strike aircraft to replace the venerable Canberra bomber. Initially, the F-111 was supposed to be both a bomber for the American Air Force and a naval variant was supposed to be used as a carrier-borne fleet air defense fighter. It was virtually impossible for one aircraft to perform both missions properly. And after millions of dollars of cost overruns and years of delay, the naval variant was dropped. The British government could not wait for the F-111 to be finished, nor could it afford it. The design of the F-111 with the variable swept wing made it a very difficult plane to develop. The concept had been around since 1911, and in World War II, German, American, and British engineers looked at the idea, but it was not until after the war did technology begin to make the concept possible. British engineer Barnes Wallace, famous for developing the bouncing bomb of dam buster fame, was instrumental in developing the swept wing design. Still, by the late 1960s, the British simply could not afford a vast research and development program. The TSR-2 program, even though cancelled, had kept key portions of the British aerospace establishment going. Had the TSR-2 been built, it probably would still be in service today, most likely as a firing platform for cruise missiles and precision-guided bombs. No matter how good the escape system, you've got to give it time to work. As flight surgeon at the safety center, I've reviewed many accident reports involving the delayed ejection. And they always illustrate at least two points. One, these seats require a finite amount of time to work. For example, depending upon the airspeed, the rear seat out of the F-4 requires four or five seconds from initiation to full parachute, and the front seat takes a second longer. And second, these systems were not designed to overcome the horrendous sink rates generated by aircraft out of control, which may exceed 600 feet per second. There's a good reason for those mandatory bailout altitudes. You just don't have much time. Not long ago, an F-4 crew was defending during a similar air combat tactics engagement, and while pressing to defeat his attacker, the young pilot departed his aircraft at roughly 8 to 9,000 feet AGL above an overcast. Now, he had a reputation as being an aggressive, up-and-coming good stick, and he tried hard to salvage his mistake. 
but apparently he got a secondary stall to avoid going in the overcast, and in they went. While, while passing through the overcast, perhaps they became disoriented, we'll never know for sure, but one thing for certain is that both he and his whistle lost awareness for how fast that aircraft was really coming down. We have indications that that aircraft dropped the eight or 9,000 feet in less than 16 seconds and possibly as little as 11 seconds for an average sink rate of between 500 and 700 feet per second. When it passed through 4,000 feet AGL, still unrecovered, it was gonna crash and it was fuel to stay with it. But when the aircraft broke to the bottom of that 1,500 foot overcast, with them still aboard, they were both dead men. The Wizzo did initiate a dual sequenced ejection at something around 1,000 AGL, but barely achieved man seat separation when he hit the ground. Amazingly, though the impact broke his thigh, that's not what killed him. He burned to death in the fireball. The airplane departed as predicted, but then went immediately into a spin. I applied the recovery controls, and the airplane started to recover. We thought we were going to make it, but it was, we were coming down very rapidly and passed through our spin chute altitude of 22,000 feet. I deployed the spin chute as brief, and the spin chute came off in the maneuver. Now things weren't going as predicted. Both engines were stagnated. As we passed through our ejection altitude, and my chase pilot yelled for me to eject, which I did after very little thought. I don't believe that up to that point I'd even thought about ejecting. Because the airplane was highly instrumented, we went back after the accident to determine how much time we had. We calculated three seconds. If we'd waited another three seconds, the chute would not have opened prior to hitting the ground.